too. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Everybody hear me? We're going to bring our man of the hour up on stage, and then he's going to have to listen to me talk for a few minutes. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Uh, this is a really great crowd for our first Night for the Museum events. This year we've got a lot of things planned for the museum and I hope you come to every one of them. Uh, this year we're going to have 10 speakers. Uh, just lots of lots of good things happening at the museum and I encourage all of you tonight after uh, Mr. Willis speaks to please go by and see what we've done in the last few months um, especially if you haven't been in but we will have the museum open uh, after we're finished here tonight uh, most of you are on my mailing list for those of you that aren't if you sign in tonight with those cards you'll, you'll be on there now uh, one of the things that we did this year that kind of keeps everybody informed, we are sending out monthly cards, so I know most of you are getting those, and we think that's, it's a good reminder, uh, you know, other than me having to call Durwood tonight. <laughs> most people are remembering. We also did our uh, newsletter, The Legends and Legacies, and I know most of you are getting that, and, and we hope to put that out at least twice a year. Uh, we've got, like I said, we've got lots of things planned. Uh, next month, we have Dr. Roy Phillips will be speaking to us, and uh, y'all will be reading more about that coming up in the newspaper. Uh, but like I said, we have lots of, of good things going on at the museum, and we've got lots of plans for 2009, and I hope all of you will, will join in with all those plans, because it's going to take all of you to keep it going. So I encourage all of you, if you're not a member, please join. Uh, you can join for as little as $20 a year and as much as whatever. <laughs> we don't, we're, we're not going to turn down any money. Uh, but we, we do appreciate you coming out tonight. I uh, want to thank Patty and Charlie Odom for allowing us to use their building. They couldn't be here tonight. I uh, want to thank uh, Charlotte Martin for preparing our, uh, I think they're all gone, but I hope some of you got it. Uh, she prepared our refreshments tonight, and I think uh, they must have been appreciated, Miss Martin. <laughs> so. And we want to thank Ty Pendergrass and Argent Financial for helping sponsor our refreshments every month. So if y'all would give Ty a round of applause, too. ways that you can help and if you have things that you'd like to donate or uh, things or if you've got an idea for a speaker please let us know. Uh, right now I'm going to bring Thad Andrus up and he's going to say a few words to you. Thanks Shannon. It, it really is wonderful to have all of you here uh, tonight. This is a really good crowd and I know many of them are here just to see John. Uh, the, we really had a wonderful year in, the, in 2008. We opened the museum, which was really a, a great a, a deal there. Uh, we, Larry Milford has done a wonderful job with the exhibits. He, he got some help from some other people, that, but it's Larry's exhibits uh, there. He really has, has done well. Uh, with it. And we have great plans for, for next year with many more exhibits uh, planned and lots of, lots of things that are going to be done uh, in, in, in the museum. Shelley's done a fine job providing uh, lots of publicity for the museum and thinking of many fundraising activities, so particularly the cookbook. She's done a, a great job uh, with that. Uh, with that, further ado, but I do have to mention that John Willis is going to say that I tricked him into coming, but if I did, I'm proud of it. <laughs> uh, at this time, I, I would like to uh, introduce his, his brother, who has moved back to the uh, Webster Paris area, uh, Dr. Gladden uh, W. Willis, Buddy Willis, 
who, who, who will introduce John to us. I'm looking forward to a great evening. Thad asked me to send, uh, send him a paragraph uh, so that he could introduce John, and I said, and I maybe rudely said, I'll do it. <laughs> I, 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 I've introduced a lot of people to meetings, but I've never had, a, had the privilege of introducing a loved brother. John uh, was born on the Willis Farm south of Dole Lane to Ada Kellen Willis and John Stillman Willis Sr. June of 1919. Ada Willis would succumb to a long illness when John was four years old <clears throat> and he would be raised by his grandparents John Gladden and Anna Willis, often spending summers in Menden with his maternal grandmother Anna, Anna Kellen. He would uh, graduate from a grant in, from LSU in agronomy and farm until the time of Pearl Harbor. As a B-17 pilot, he would fly 35 missions out of Deep and Green Air Base in England, which had the highest casualty rates of any of the bomber groups, above 80 percent. He would receive the Distinguished Flying Cross. After returning from the war, John would marry a young lady, Joanne Wilson, and our father would have been remarried to my mother-to-be, who would die when I was eight years old, again after a long and difficult illness. Surrounding the time of her death, I would more or less move in with John and Joanne. In latter years, I would wander at the maturity of a very young lady who would take a scruffy eight- and nine-year-old boy she did not know into her home and treat him as a little brother. I eventually came to believe that some of her grace and maturity at so young an age came from her understanding of the very short timeline of her life, which I did not know about at the time. Both John Stemmon and our father would remarry loving wives, John DeLee in life, and there would be then a long period of stability in our lives. I would like to end this on one note. If one takes the express out of Paddington Station and heads northeast to Cambridge, one might then rent a car and visit the American Cemetery in Cambridge, where the, those airmen who made it back to England to die are interred. Then one might proceed again northeast into the pastoral farmland in the hump of England, which protrudes out over the English Channel. There, with patience, one can find remnants of the 150 or so American air bases that were clustered in this area. Farmers used the remnants of the airstrip to store hay, and a few old rusted Quonset huts are still present. And occasionally one will see one of these two-story control towers with observation decks around the second floor. One can stand on the old airfields and try to imagine what it was like to take off into the early morning English fog, gather above the clouds, and know that on a bad day, countless numbers of their groups would not be touching back down on those same runways eight or nine hours later. One knows that one can never understand what it was like to stand in their shoes, but one can believe that many facing death at the wrong end of life, fighting for something they loved out of duty and honor, like those young, young women so long ago, found grace and maturity before their age. Johnny has a wonderful memory. He has dozens, if not hundreds, of stories. And I hope that uh, you get to enjoy a good many of them. <laughs> about some of the things that happened to me in my growing up years and 
most especially about my experiences in World War II. Uh, I sat there wondering why anybody would want to listen to me talk about myself. <laughs> and the, groping for a courteous way to say no. Uh, failing all, in all of that, I did say I'll think about it. You know, about a week or ten days later, I got a letter from him. The first line of the letter was, you have been scheduled to speak. <laughs> summer months after graduating, I didn't have the first clue what was going to happen to me. But after lunch at my grandmother's table, my daddy, one of my uncles, and I was rocking that lunch off on that front porch. And I heard the uncle say, what Johnny going to do this fall? And my daddy answered him by saying, Oh, I'm going to send him down to LSU. He said, he's going to the university and, and he's going to study agriculture. <laughs> well, I found out what was going to happen to me and what I was going to do. <laughs> I didn't have any, any input into that. I knew that was what was going to happen to me. Uh, I made my reservation. And freshmen didn't have to show up a week sooner than everybody else. When the time came, Daddy's youngest brother, Lord, some of you know him, took me to Baton Rouge. He drove up in front of the Pentagon Barracks. Everything down there then was new. The campus was new. It was a beautiful place, much prettier than it is now. Uh, we got out and pulled my little footlock out of the trunk of the car and he sat it down on the curb. And uh, he said, well, all the way home, I get started. That was in the days of hazing, and it was <coughs> all around. Well, I found a place I was supposed to live. I found something else, too, that I didn't know about until then. In uh, those days, LSU being a land grant school, Every male that went to school there had to take military training for two years. It was a must, unless he had something physically wrong with it. At the end of two years, if you wanted to, you could apply for advanced training. And upon graduation, you would get a commission as a second lieutenant. Well, the military took over my life about that time with me standing there with my little son. And I didn't have to make any heavy decisions. They, they decided everything for me. Uh, they'd form up at 8 o'clock in the morning outside the barracks and again at 1 o'clock. You'd be marched to the place you were supposed to go and told what to do. I needed all of that. <laughs> but I, I grew to like it. They fifth diluted the program, and I think we made a mistake when we did that. Uh, when I graduated, I was too young to get that commission. And at graduation exercise, I got a roll of typing paper with a ribbon on it, a note inside. When you're old enough, I'll send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I went, went home to join the farming effort at home. Being an educated farmer, a grindist, a big shot. Uh, the family was getting away from cotton, which had been the cash crop for several generations. And uh, my total effort was with Puerto Rican yams. The, uh, I go to the year that Pearl Harbor happened. 
That year I had 165 acres of potato slips. I threw it out. Two other farmers in the community had sizable acres, all with the understanding that I, that I would would uh, grade, pack, and ship everybody's potato. By we started digging in, in late July, and I started shipping. By the first of December, we had finished the harvest, and we had all our potato storage full. That was waiting for the better market, which would come after Christmas. That, up to that point, I had shipped about 50 refrigerated cars with number one Puerto Rican Yankee. Well, you know what happened on December the 7th? Yeah. A really tore us up. Shortly after Christmas, I got a telegram. <laughs> to get a telegram in Darlene was most unusual. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be, it had to be driven from Memphis. Somebody that tried from Memphis. But they, they put, seeing the, who it came from, they brought it to me. So, uh, the thing said, uh, orders are being cut, placing you on active duty. You will proceed at once. <coughs> camp order guard for the fifth is going to report you after Camp Wheeler, Georgia. Well, I got on a bus and went down to that exam. Got out there at the hospital after dark. It was, well, it might have been 10 o'clock at night. I found the duty officer in the hospital. The fellow was sitting there ran right back his feet on his bed. I, like he'd had a hard day. <laughs> I handed him the telegram. And he, he looked at the telegram and he looked at me. He said, has the doctor looked at you lately? Yes, sir. <coughs> when? Oh, about three months ago. Did he find anything wrong with you? If he did, he didn't tell. <laughs> The doctor handed the telegram back and he said, uh, you look like you're in pretty good shape, so just catch that train in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I reported to Camp Wheel. They were in, in Georgia. Shortly after I got there, I made the acquaintance of a fellow who was about my age, graduate of Clemson. Uh, product of the ROTC. Uh, Julie called up to service, just like we. We had a lot of things in common. In, in short, we soon faith, formed a faith friendship. This friendship was the last throughout the war. Every change that I made, he made. It, it, was, it was remarkable that two people could stay together all the way through it, but we did. Two stations, two changes of station later, and about six months later. Both those were part of the cadre of the 78th Infantry Division at Camp Butler, North Carolina. The uh, contractor was still building the camp. It was, they had some of the worst mud I ever saw in my life. Everywhere you went was mud. Uh, we went by regimental headquarters every day to read the notices on the bulletin board. That day we stood there looking at that and there was a notice on there that said uh, commission personnel like shaved tips like we were could uh, take pilot training and take it in grade. We would apply directly to the, the chief of state, John George C. Marshall. Direct. It would go through channels. It would direct the promotion <coughs> for permission to do that. But we looked at that mud and thought about those, those fellas don't wave this mud and they go home and sleep in a dry bed at night. <laughs> so we applied. And it, the, the, we were we uh, accepted for pilot training. Up to that time, all of the pilot training had been gone through the cadet program, and everything in the system was geared for the cadet program. So we were kind of, uh, 
outcast in the system. And then there were only a few of them. Of course, we had our first station for primary training was Clarksdale, Mississippi. It was uh, run by civilians, and the, the instructors were all over uh, crop dust, so you know what we had to contend with. <laughs> <laughs> that was wild for us. Uh, they, they do some crazy things. After a few hours, one was supposed to fly by oneself. They called it solo. Uh, when my day came to solo, I went out and managed to do what was expected. And I taxied back up to the flight line in my steerman. J.B. Tenson, that, that good friend of mine, had all the cadets lined up on the flight line down on their knees. <laughs> well, I had a lot of hands. Uh, the next station, we were back in the Army, run by the Army, for basic training. It was a field in Arkansas. Uh, they wouldn't let us live in the back of the office quarters because we were students. Had plenty of room there, but we were students, so we couldn't live with the regular ones. Uh, we could, of course couldn't live with the cadets. So they set aside a little building on the edge of the field and, and put us up there. There must, I think there were six of us in that group. They had a regulation there that one could not fly, they could not wear flying clothes off the flight line. Now the cadets got around it because they could put their flight clothes on and support and go back and forth in formation. But we didn't do that. And they wouldn't give us the lockers on the flight line like the, the instructors had because we were still in uh, So we just walked back and forth across the reservation of well, our flight clothes. We didn't have any choice. One day, I, of all people, the base commander called me, Major Brown. Now, Major Brown was a little short and feisty fellow. He had a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> he was a pop school, what we call the, the, the trade school, West Point. First thing you want to know is what my name was. So I came in there and showed up, I didn't say anything else. He, now he, we were dealing with a problem that only he could fix, the only fella. But he chose to ignore that and he gave me a shoe and out of this world. Oh, well, I thought he never would eat. But finally he was out of breath and walked on. I kept on doing the same thing. I didn't have any choice. I just kept draw, walking across that one looked like little. But two stations, two changes of stations late, later, JB and I had already one gotten our wings, our pilot's wings. When we got our wings, they asked us, what, what do you want to fly? Both of us want to fly the B-17. And they granted us that route. And uh, we were at, at Chinook Field in Illinois, getting transitioned into B-17s. Uh, of course, the pilot had to be a navigator too in those days. I was getting trained in both of those things. And one day I scheduled a, a cross-country flight in B-17 and left the field up in Illinois. I went back down in Arkansas to Major Brown for the field. I let that B-17 down, just, just almost on the ground. And went clear across his little feet. <laughs> <laughs> it was a classic buzz dog. <laughs> when, when you do that, you get everybody's attention. <laughs> I pulled back up the traffic altitude and circled his field and called that tower down there. This is Lieutenant Willis. Give Major Brown my regard. <laughs> I got the last word in the college. 
I broke several regulations. That day. You know, my country needed people like me so bad all over the world that, that they weren't going to waste my time. <laughs> the, next, the next change, the next station was phase training. That's where we got our crews. That was at Powell, Texas. We had three months out there that. Came that last day. They pulled a long train into the field that made up Pullman coaches and baggage coaches. It would have a field kitchen on it to feed us and room for our baggage. And, <clears throat> and we were well, well cared for. The Pullman, Pullman coaches were nice. They had rooms in them. JB and I had a room together on, on that. As they pulled out of field, they stopped the train on the side track there, I guess to clear the track ahead of us. You know, they stopped that train right behind Powell's only package store. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a, a bridge track in the, through that back door. <laughs> Finally, they got the track clear, they pulled us out on the main line. That train wouldn't be stopped anymore until it got to Grand Island, Nebraska. The only thing it would stop it for would be to change the crews and the engines. That night, we, uh, uh, this, a select group of us, all first pilots, had been together all through the train, met in one of the baggage coaches up there. We, somebody got a number three washed up and put about oh, four or five inches of crushed ice in. In those days when you, you bought something at the package store, if you could get something you could stand to drink, you would have to buy something with a strange name on it. I don't, I don't know whether any of you remember that or not, but that was the way it worked. Well, we gathered around that tub and emptied those bottles, strange name and all. <laughs> and got our cups and the serious business started. <laughs> that, that was the business of naming the planes that we were going to fly. Well, it, it was a pretty good party. Got, got, finally got all that tent to. The next morning, they pulled that train into that air base at Grand Island, Nebraska, and started unloading that run. That was a, boy, that was a sorry looking one. <laughs> They didn't help with the mercy on me. You know, law enforcement likes to make you stand in line and process you, they call it. We had about 18 or 19 hours of constant standing in line for one various reason or another. And no sleep at all. And then they came out and told us that. This was a place, see, we were supposed to get our new B-17 and fly it overseas, across the North Atlantic to the year. Then it came out and said, uh, the well in the North Atlantic is terrible. We're not going to let you fly it. We're going to send you by ship. We're back on that train again. <laughs> the next stop was uh, Camp Kiln, New Jersey. <clears throat> Two or three more days of that, standing in line and processing. Back on another train, and when they stopped the train that time, we were at the water's edge, New York Harbor. Uh, we got off the train, they had some ferry boats that were carried across the river. It a busy place, there were a lot of <coughs> boats out in that water. I looked across at that harbor, there was a big, tall, multi story pier stuck out in the, in the water. And alongside one of them was a huge ship. That's where they carried us, that pier, the other side of that pier. We, we got off and started going, what in the elevator in the pier? We started climbing steps, <coughs> carrying everything we owned on our back. Finally, got up high enough that they, they had a door open in the hull of the ship. It wasn't up to the deck level, but down at the, on the hull, that open door where we could get in. As we went through the door, each of us was given a slip of paper. That piece of paper told us where we would sleep and, and when and where we would eat. 
I found, we found, JB and I found a sleeping quarters on the A deck, little stateroom, and we made 12 in that stateroom with our baggage. Now, that fills one all the way up. <laughs> On that, that other information on that slip of paper had to do with our meeting. It was it made two times two times in a 24-hour period. And it, it named a spot that you would go to. In other words, you would go to that spot, get in line, and, and uh, they would feed you. The, the kitchens on that ship never did stop. Operate. They work 24 hours. Uh, we, we, each person on there would get two meals in a 24 hour period. It didn't have anything to do with meal time, it was just two times of the 24 hours. It was the Queen Elizabeth, Britain's newest uh, ship. And we were told that there were 18,000 that was on there. The next morning, Tug got around that thing and drug it out there in the, in the river and got it aimed down the river. And we left. The last thing I saw was the Statue of Liberty. By ourselves, no escort, crossed that North Atlantic in seven days. Uh, I, I thought it was a terrible risk to take, but I guess it wasn't as much as I thought it was. When we reached the other side, it was the west coast of Scotland. The body of water, long, narrow body of water, ran in and it had mountains on three sides of it. And where we went in, they had a, a uh, barricade in the water with a gate in it. That was to keep the submarines, the German submarines, out of, out of this, that body of water. No pier there. They dropped anchor and we started unloading on the ferry there were 50 crews of us, 500 Air Force, it unloaded there. We were sent to a distribution center and where they split us up to go to various uh, groups. I think there were six groups of us that were sent to the full 52nd bomb group. Uh, when we arrived, they uh, split us up. There were four squadrons in that. <coughs> Seven, 28th, 29th, 30th, and 31st squadrons. JB and I were still together. This is two of us assigned to that 728 squad. So they provided the truck for us and hauled us and our baggage down to the squadron, 728 squadron there, and stopped in front of the order room. Our room was one of those bell listen huts. JB and I got out to go see about getting quarters to sign while the crew was unloading the baggage out there. We, as we entered, it, there was a big room, a good many desks in it, and only one man in the room. He was at the back end. And he was sitting at the desk with his elbows on top of the desk and forehead down in the palm of his hand like he might have been taking a nap or might have been praying, I don't know. <laughs> uh, he didn't know we were there until we were standing in front of his desk. He was a seasoned fellow. He was kind of grizzled, a little bit tough looking. He was the first sergeant, typical first sergeant. He looked up as we stopped, and JB told him, that, sorry, we're going to have to have some quarters for us and for our crew. The man said, damn. He said, I'm glad to see y'all. He said, when he ain't got no crews left, that we ain't even got a commanding officer left. And that's, that's, that's bad news when you hear something like this. <laughs> JB turned and he said, Willis, I don't know whether we want to stay or not. So this part has got pretty rough. <laughs> it's like we can turn back home. The 
next morning, they had a meeting over at the group headquarters. <coughs> the executive officer of the group chaired the meeting. Uh, of these six crews that had joined that his group, that was the Gillis County indoctrinated, I guess. He opened the meeting by saying, you fellas probably think we're winning this war, don't you? He said, I've got news for you. He says, we're not. We're losing this war. Uh, things, things wasn't getting any better than her. Uh, he went on to explain that if one could do 20 missions, one would be sent back to the United States for rest and recuperation. Uh, 25 was what he said, not 20, but 25. No one in the group had ever reached that point. Uh, they, uh, among the other things they did that morning was to uh, assign us a, a, a B-17. Uh, we were given a, a serial number, and after the meeting, we, uh, I walked down the flight line to see what I was going to fly. And when I found it, I found a well-worn resident of a B-17. Far cry from that new one. I thought I'd go get a that grand <laughs> <laughs> The last thing I, I did was that wreck of it. It is, it is really, you could look at it and tell that thing had really been to the wall. But I had to tell you. Uh, at that first meeting, he also explained that the pilots of, of each crew would make their first mission as a co-pilot in another crew, a crew that had been there before at least one time. The next morning, I went out as a co-pilot on the crew. And we hit the, just about hit the, the enemy coast going in and hit a well front at the same time. Well, you can't fly formation on instruments, so that broke that, that thing up in the herd. I knew that mission was scratched then. But the fellow flying the plane just kept milling around, driving around and riding around in that cloud. And I was wondering, what's that fool? Why doesn't he go on back home? Uh, all at once there was a flash of light, real close, bright light. And he said, you see that? Yeah. He said, that's flat. He said, we can go home now. <laughs> on the way home, he explained that. He said, had I gone home without us seeing flat, we wouldn't have got credit for a mission. He said, we've been shot at him. <laughs> you, know, that, you know, that was the easiest one I ever took. <laughs> I never could find it that easy anywhere else. <laughs> the, next, the next five missions I flew, three of them were to Berlin. And that was, that was a bad place to go. Berlin. Those trips we made were for the most part were expensive. We, we, we did a lot of damage and we took a lot of damage too. We lost both people in airplanes. We brought airplanes back home that were damaged. That B-17 could take more damage than anything I, I'd ever seen. Though. And still fly, you just give it a chance. Four times in my stay over there, was shot up so bad that I couldn't stay with the crowd going home and had to go home by myself. And I, that's, that's a lonesome feeling when you do that. Uh, every once in a while, we would uh, fly a mission that, that, that would just, everything would unravel. Nothing would work right. <coughs> I, uh, I try to carry you along with me on a couple of those. They had a, before I take you on, on that first one, I'll tell you, I'll back up and tell you one of the instances you may get a little chuckle out of. That, that wreck I was flying was giving me so much trouble. I went out and started a mission one morning, and by the time 
but before we reached the enemy course going in, I decided that, that I'd had enough of those old sorry engines. Had one that morning was really acting up. So I fell out of formation, but, but there was a spare father, a spare ship father to take my place. I knew that before I got out. And so I took my place back home, set it on the ground. <coughs> Well, when one does that, one had to meet a board and explain why you did that. I knew that all the time. Well, I met that board, and one of the people on there was a base of the group commander. He was new to that. Uh, I told him specifically the reason I turned it around that morning about that bad engine. What I didn't tell him was the long list I had of other things that were wrong with that airplane. And it, it, it was an impressive list. Well, I left the, that meeting and got back to the hut. And I walked in, J.B. was sitting there on the bed with a fifth of good bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of good bourbon in those days, kind of like hen's teeth. You just couldn't hardly find it. I don't know where, where the guy that stole it, but he had it. Anyway. And he said, well, let's see what we can do about this box. So we proceeded to dispatch that fifth of this. <laughs> it was late in the day when we started, but when it finished, it was dark. We decided we were hungry then, so we go up to the mess hall, which was officer's club, too, and get us something to eat. Well, about a quarter of a mile up there, we walked up there and approached that blackout door, and I said, most of you don't know what a blackout door is or have, maybe never have seen one, I'll describe one to you. The only <coughs> side door that you, you would enter, and then there'd be a, maybe a six foot square little spot, <coughs> and you'd turn either 90 degrees right or left and go through another door. That kept the light from spilling outside so the Germans could see us at night. Well, J.B. and I approached that first door, me leading the parade. And as I went through it and turned, there were two men coming through that other door. The two men come through that door, the one in front was Lieutenant Jimmy, uh, uh, General, Jimmy Dulles, the man who led the raid on Tokyo. He was also, at that time, he was in command of the 8th Air Force. Right behind him was Colonel Sherman, the base commander. Well, I, I was in pretty well inebriated. <laughs> <laughs> and I was ready to discuss everything that was wrong with that damn airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I had a captive audience. <laughs> Somebody who could do something. <laughs> Well, I, I manfully lit in to get the tent of that shore. And while I was doing that, J.B. was hung on my back back <laughs> His chin was on that right shoulder. <laughs> and every other breath, J.B. was saying, Hell and by the world. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it never had been shot at. 
<laughs> it was the sweetest flying plane I ever flew. It used less gas to get you better than any of the other. I really had it made. Now back to those things that unraveled on. There was there were some oil refiners in, in east of Europe that we couldn't reach. They're out of our range from Britain. They're also out of the range of ships from Italy. Uh, somebody decided, somebody that didn't have to do the job, decided <laughs> that if, if we took off in Britain, bombed a, a, a German target and landed in Russia, we could load up in Russia and bomb these targets and land in Italy. Then, of course, we could, on the way home, we could hit a target in France. They called them shuttle missions. Mm -hmm. This was the first one they'd ever dreamed of. And we would be, be made a part of it. It took them three days. They, they locked the base up for three days. Wouldn't let anybody come and go while they got ready for it. We were told to pack a bag like we'd go take a trip. And when we got up, unloaded on the other end, we would get off, we would change our flight clothes into a dress uniform before we stepped off the ship. <laughs> then the day came along and we took off. Uh, the favorite way into Europe, the one in the used to lock was over the side of the sea. The coastline was so broken up that the Germans had a hard time putting enough artillery in there to give us much so that morning we flew out over the North Sea and went into Europe over the side of the sea. The lead ship got us too close to a German battery down there. One of us put a hole in one of my wing tanks. This, this was a long mission ahead of us. The ship underneath, me, the pilot of the ship underneath the call and told me, where the leak was. So I knew what tank it was coming out of. Uh, B-17 had four engine tanks and two wing tanks. It was one of the wing tanks that had a hold in them. The other tanks by then, at that time, had little room in them. So we transferred what gas we could out of that tank and saved it. The bunch going to Russia bombed a target south of, of Berlin. The rest of the Air Force turned, turned north from that point and bombed targets in the area of, in Berlin and in nearby vicinity. They, of course, turned for home when they finished that job. And that was supposed to draw the German Air Force off of us. Because we kept straight on the east. And it worked for a little while. <laughs> And then they caught us over Poland, and we had a fight with the German fighters over Poland. We lost a few planes there, too. Just before sundown, we approached a, a field on the outskirts of Poltava, Russia. A runway had been built out of steel mats in, in what appeared to be a, a, a wheat field. All of us were out of gas when we got there. We'd been in there 12 and a half hours. Uh, managed to get down though without anybody running out before we hit the ground. <coughs> they had a field kitchen that had a feed and had some tents with cops uh, out there for sleeping. Uh, before sundown, we looked up and saw a bike trail way up high. We knew what that was. That's a German reconnaissance plane. He, he was checking us out. Saw him turn and go back. Well, it, night came on and we, we went to sleep. Uh, after a while, I woke up and the whole countryside was lit up like daylight. The sky was full of <coughs> Players, apparently on each one of them on a parachute. Uh, the Germans lit the place up and did a third job of tearing up all our airplanes. Uh, before they left, 
they littered up all that high grass out there with little tiny antipersonnel devices. It's a mean little thing. It, you've got it tagged with it. It hurts you. When day broke, I looked out across that field. Every B-17 out there was either blown up or damaged, severely damaged. <laughs> this country, boy from Dalveen, was a long way from home. <coughs> no way, to, no way to move except walk, and nothing to fight with but that. <laughs> About 10 o'clock that morning, we were listening to the German music on that stage. They, they had the best music, and they knew we listened to them. They stopped the music and told us that they knew they got our planes last night and they'd be back together. <laughs> the Russians would let that reconnaissance, German reconnaissance plane look at us every evening, and when he turned and went back, they would load us up in trucks and carry us to the bushes. We'd sleep out in the woods somewhere. Then they'd pick us up uh, before day the next morning, set us back down for that morning of the council's play to look at. In the meantime, the Russians brought a lot of people in there to clean up all that anti-personnel stuff. And that was a chore to clean up. It was kind of like booby traps. But they got them cleaned up. And uh, we were several days doing it. One morning, a C-46 landed. C-46 was a twin-engine transport. <coughs> it carried about 25 people. And landed out there. And the, the process of getting us out started. I don't know how it was determined who would fly when or how. It certainly wasn't by crews. Because I was among the first to leave. Um, I got on there with 24 other all those lieutenants. The fellow flying the plane was exhausted. And he told me, he said, I, he, said he said, I can't go much further. So uh, he didn't have a co pilot. I said, Well, uh, I'm going to help you fly. I'd not really fly up in front and know what's going on and sleep in the back end and not know what's going on. So I, I was co pilot all the way out on that. The first stop on that coming out. Of course, we were in German airspace and flying when they, I mean, Russian airspace, and flying when they said fly, where they said fly. The first leg was down to Kiel. We landed in a field down there that was all solid, about a square mile of it, just crooked flat and grass on it. It was a little frame building on the edge of it. Uh, File taxes up somewhere close to that. We had a problem. We couldn't speak Russian. <laughs> they didn't have anybody that could speak Russian. <laughs> Finally, they found somebody that could speak French, and one of the pilots <coughs> on the plane with us could, could do a little French, so we, we could talk to them a little bit. We, we hadn't had anything to eat or drink all day. The atmosphere was strained. We were in foreign country and didn't know what was going to happen to us. Uh, they made us understand, get out and come in that building. When we went in there, there was one big room that had a bunch of little square wooden tables. Each one of them had four chairs to it. And there were enough that a seat all 25 of us. So they made us know to sit down, which we did. At <clears throat> uh, so that time, we were worried. I could see some women working in another room, apparently a kitchen that looked like they were going to feed them. In a minute, one of the Russian women came through the door with a big tray full of water glasses, about that high. Well, we've been told about that water, you fellas get pretty sick drinking some bad water. She gave each one of us glass. I picked my up directly and sipped to it. That wasn't water. You know, in just a 
few minutes, international relations really did. <laughs> <laughs>
this is the way that worked. In the lead ship of the group, that bombardier was the only one that did the aiming. All other bombardiers sat and watched his bomb bay with their hand on a switch. His first bomb that fell out had a smoke streamer on it. When, when the other bombardier saw that, they flipped the switch. Then the bombs came out, everybody's bombs came out with a little interval between them. This made a blanket of fire on the ground. So we, we made that bomb run and that bombardier didn't drop. He sailed right on by that target. I saw it, but he apparently couldn't see it. I was afraid he was going to kill the Frenchman. They well, sailed out in the water, made a long sweeping 360 degree turn back to that initial point where we started that bomb run and started the second bomb run. By that time, the Germans had that, those, those gun sights really sharpened up. They were, they were getting good with them. We made that bomb run. Would you believe it? He didn't drop that second time. He did not drop it. No, the big wide circle, way back. All that time, those Bombay doors opened, and that was a terrible strain on those engines, all that drag. We started. The third bomber. Well, <coughs> by that time, the Germans were putting, almost putting that stuff in our lap up there. And they were knocking airplanes out, too. We were losing planes. About halfway down that bomb run, I lost an engine. But when one lost an engine, you had to feather that propeller blade so that it wouldn't win me. Of course, you let it windmill, it would tear the engine out of the front of the wind. <coughs> in order to do that, you had to use the oil from the crankcase of that engine. Now, if that engine had been hit and was leaking oil, you better be fast to get your part of that oil before it all leaked out. So if the thing it had to be done quick, I, I was after quick. By the time I finished that, I lost another one. So it had to fell the second. By that time, I was dropped out of formation. I had instinctively turned the nose toward home, and and they told the bombardier to, to unload those bombs. I said, drop them all right now, and close that door, 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 which he did. No sooner had I feathered that second. Then the third engine, which the propeller was running away, the government on it had apparently been damaged. I had one engine there that was working, giving me everything it could. <coughs> and this one, with bad government on it, I, I throttled it back until I could control the RPMs and get a little something out of it. It was better than having the thing fill it. Call the engineer down out of the top turret. Sorry, killing. Let's see how much weight you can get out of this bird. Well, you know, all those 50 caliber machine guns and big boxes of ammunition. The ship had a radio room in it and it had 750 pounds of radio equipment in it. There was a lot of things we could throw out and, and the sergeant really did. He did a jam up job for me. He stripped it almost to the skin. <laughs> and then the fight came to convert. What altitude I had left for miles out there in front of me. Had to fly through that well front that time on engine, on instrument. When losing just a little altitude all along so I could maintain enough speed not stalled out, gradually losing, sinking. Got out to about a thousand feet and, and dropped out of the bottom of the cloud. I could see the water down there. Mm -hmm. Out in front, I was on the horizon in a minute or two, I could see a shoreline. It was the south coast of Britain. Within, I'd say another, Many of the two, 
I saw on that South Coast of Britain a long <laughs> runway. Had a bunch of bricks. I had, I had found a pre-war brick, uh, pre-war uh, British Air Force. Without knowing it was that, I'd flown straight to it. Had enough altitude to go halfway around it and line up. Drop, as I dropped the wheel and land, I had to turn the radio to the frequency of that tower. It, I didn't ask him for permission to land because I knew I had to land. He said, uh, pull up, you know, I can go around. What? What did you think of pull the wheel? <laughs> I had to land. I did land. I wasn't very welcome here. They, they, they took care of us because they had to, but they, they uh, I think they looked on us as uncouth colonials. <laughs> <laughs> very cool treatment. <laughs> Three days later, somebody came and picked me up. I uh, flew a few more missions. <coughs> and finally came the day I, I flew my 35th mission. <coughs> IG Fog and Chemical Works, like you know, it wasn't an easy mission. But I, I, I lived through it, got back. Then too later, JB flew his last mission too. Um, we had survived. I had survived. Not only that, that I survived, but every air crew member who flew in my ship survived. Every one of them survived to <coughs> go home to his family on her. Shortly after that, the group <coughs> issued a set order to send me back to the States. They all, at that time, they also awarded me a certificate. They called it the Lucky Bastard System. I didn't think luck had anything to do with it. <laughs> it was my fault then, and, and, and it, to this day, it's still my fault. But it's uh, our good Lord had his arm around. Yeah. I still believe that. Yeah. And my friend, that's it. <laughs>
sale back here if anybody would like to purchase those. And I'll be back here for just a few minutes and then we'll all go over to the museum or those that want to. Uh, but there again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. And don't forget, next month um, we'll have a, another real good speaker, Dr. Phillips. And he's here tonight. Uh, but he's written a book and, and y'all are going to really enjoy his presentation. Uh, but there again, I want to thank all of you for coming out. I know uh, Mr. Willis thanks you for all coming out and we appreciate him. <laughs>